If your mom approves of the music you're listening to in high school, that's probably not a good sign for the future of that genre. What's up, everybody? I am Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about ska, or more specifically, the ska punk boom of the 90s. Because once upon a time, when you said the word punk, it was oftentimes paired with ska. Like, hey, you should come to the show tonight. There's gonna be a bunch of like punk and ska bands. It's gonna be cool. This was especially true in the mid to late 90s when bands like the Boss Tones, Goldfinger, Real Big Fish, Save Ferris, and of course, no doubt, were all over mainstream TV and radio selling millions and millions of albums. It seemed like ska was on top of the world, but then, all of a sudden the ska bubble popped almost overnight. And since then, ska has been pretty much like the redheaded stepchild of the alternative music world. So what happened? How did ska punk go from being the hot new trend that seemed like it was taking over the world to pretty much falling completely off the map just a few years later? And what, if anything, was its lasting impact? These are the questions that I will answer in this video. And also I wanna thank Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Raid Shadow Legends is a turn-based dark fantasy RPG that's free to play for iOS, Android, and PC. It's got 13 playable factions, and today we're gonna talk about one of them, the High Elves. High Elves are the classic good guys, mostly. But to find out more, you'll just have to meet them in the story campaign. For now, here's one of my favorite High Elven champions. Personally, my favorite part of the game is how deep you can go with customization. And last month, Raid just announced their biggest update ever. The main event here is the Doom Tower. It's a giant tower with 120 floors, a bunch of secret challenge rooms, and 12 seriously badass bosses to take on. The raid team are giving away a bunch of free new goodies, plus a super special champion to help everybody get started in the tower named Bulwark. All you have to do is hit the link in the description. And if you're a new player, you'll get your free Void Champion Bulwark, 50 gems, an XP booster, some energy refills, and even an Ancient Shard as soon as you're in game. And all this treasure will be waiting for you right here. You can find me in game under the name PRMBA. And if you're quick enough, maybe you can even join my clan. Just click the link in the description and I'll see you in the game. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. As you can see right now, Ska is just skyrocketing. It actually has its own dance too, known as skanking. Which brings us to the first part of this, my personal introduction to Ska Punk in 1992 or so. This was right around when I was first starting to really get into like DIY punk and hardcore. And I became aware that Ska Punk was a thing when a friend of mine made a mixtape for me that had Operation Ivy on it. And I was like, what is this? This is like punk reggae, kind of weird, but I loved it. They were so catchy, so fun. And he explained to me that this was called ska punk and told me the basic history of ska, that it came from Jamaica back in the day and actually came before reggae, then became kind of cousins with the punk and oi scene in the UK in the 70s, and how there were actually a bunch of bands like Operation Ivy that were doing the ska punk thing. For example, Rancid, who he described to me as Lint from Operation Ivy's new band. They had just put out their seven inch. Or Citizen Fish, Dick Lucas from Subhuman's new band. And the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, who I knew of for being on Tang Records, the same label as SSD, as well as tons of other bands like Skank and Pickle, Dancehall Crashers, and Mustard Plug, all doing variations on that same core idea of ska punk. I checked that stuff out, but I really didn't like any of it as much as I liked Operation Ivy. So I just kind of ignored this whole ska thing that was going on until a couple years later when you just couldn't ignore it because it was everywhere. And if I had to put a specific time frame on that as like the one moment, the exact time that ska really blew up, it would be 1995. The first was the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones appearing in Clueless and on the soundtrack. which wasn't considered like the legendary movie that it is now, but was a very popular movie with mainstream teenagers back then. I saw it when it came out and loved it. So to see the Boston's in there, who I was familiar with and I knew had like legit ties to the Boston hardcore scene, really meant something to me as far as ska punk's arrival in the mainstream. The second thing was no doubt absolutely blowing up on the back of Just a Girl and Spiderwebs. Sorry. 
And I know the ska purists don't think of them as a ska band, and understandably so, because other than their first album, they really don't sound like ska. But the fact of the matter is that people did refer to them as a ska band and did associate with them with that scene. And so they drew a lot of attention to the genre, especially a lot of girls who, let's face it, are oftentimes not exactly welcomed with open arms by the punk scene. So I think for them, seeing Gwen up there being this really strong, iconic front woman was a big deal. And lastly, Rancid, whose album And Out Come the Wolves came out that year and had several singles that got mainstream attention. They were all over MTV, in Rolling Stone and Spin, which I thought was pretty cool because it was only a few years earlier that they were just another Gilman band with a seven inch on Lookout. And of course, there were tons more smaller bands doing things on the underground level, and I will mention some of them later. But to me, those were the three bands they were really driving the ska punk boom. And in the case of the Bostones and Rancid, had very clear roots in the DIY punk and hardcore scene that kept them from getting too far into the corniness that made it hard for me to get into a lot of the other ska punk bands. And I'm not surprised because with those three bands, you have all the raw ingredients. First of all, world-class, incredibly good songs. Whether you like those bands or not, all three of them are just objectively great songwriters. I actually think you can make a very good case for Tim Armstrong being the single best punk songwriter of all time. And second, you had stars. Tim Armstrong and Dickie Barrett were both big personalities, but Gwen Stefani is obviously the real standout here because as we all know, she went on to become a true pop culture icon who transcended music and has influence in fashion and TV and media, just general pop culture. Now that I think about it, she was probably the single biggest star out of the entire 90s punk scene. And I really do need to do a whole video about her because I actually think she's very underrated. And with that, thanks to the those three bands, the ska punk boom was officially underway. Which brings us to part two, the boom from roughly 1996 to 1999. For a few years there, ska was the thing in the punk scene. There was a massive flood of new bands popping up every month. Every label was scrambling to sign a ska band. Like I mentioned earlier, a hardcore label like Victory signed Catch-22. Tooth and Nail had the Supertones. By the way, this is not a Five Iron Frenzy hat. This is an undefeated hat. A lot of people ask about that. And this is where we saw a second wave of ska punk bands that, at least as far as I know, didn't really have any connection to like the DIY punk and hardcore scenes, but were more like byproducts of the ska punk scene itself. Goldfinger was the first big one that I noticed. I remember Here in Your Bedroom being a big hit with all the skate punk kids that I knew. Real Big Fish being another big one. I always thought of them kind of as like the poor man's Goldfinger. Save Ferris had a little bit of a hit with their cover of Come On Eileen. But to me, they were most notable because their drummer was in a band called Mind Rot with some of the guys from Dystopia. Very random. And of course, Sublime, who I've been wanting to talk about in a video for a while because as popular as they were, I actually think they're super underrated. Some of the best lyrics you will ever find. Bradley Noel was one of these just insanely talented songwriters who's just honestly head and shoulders above pretty much everybody else in the genre as far as talent. And if you actually pay attention to their lyrics, they're extremely dark and heavy. It's anything but like frat party music. For example, my personal favorite Sublime song is Bad Fish. You can just feel so much pain and sadness in the music. And it's almost like too much for me to handle sometimes. When you grab a hold of me. So there were all those bands happening and blowing up, but the biggest change that I noticed was actually at the local level, where there was a whole new crop of kids coming into the scene via ska punk. For lack of a better word, I guess I would describe them as like G-rated band nerd type kids. And one time at band camp? The kind of kids who I think had maybe been watching the scene from the periphery before, but really didn't feel welcome to participate until then. It felt to me like the natural next step after Green Day and The Offspring blew up a couple years before that. 
those bands brought in a ton of new people who, to put it bluntly, were a lot less fucked up and dysfunctional than the kind of people who were into punk before that. Which makes sense. I mean, the offspring are certainly a lot more accessible than, say, Black Flag or Discharge. <laughs> Where bands like cro or Suicidal Tendencies look like they might rob you, the ska punk bands were the exact opposite of that in terms of both their music and their just overall demeanor. That was somewhat true of the earlier bands like Operation Ivy and the Boss Tones, but especially the later bands like Real Big Fish or Save Ferris, who almost sounded like the theme song to a Nickelodeon show, and the people in the band looked like characters from Salute Your Shorts. Run, we jump, we swim and play. The most extreme example of that would be like the Aquabats, who are almost like the real life version of some Cartoon Network show. And to be clear, I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I think it was awesome. It made me very happy to see those kids come into the scene. I was friends with a lot of them. And even though I was more into like the hardcore scene and was starting to listen to a lot of death metal around then, I felt like the kids who came in through the ska scene were kind of a breath of fresh air. You could say that they're corny or whatever, but personally, I would much rather hang out with them than some quote unquote real punk who was just a jaded cynical asshole that's too cool for everything and spent their free time listening to Total Chaos and drinking 40s behind 7-Eleven. Ska gave those G-rated kids a way to be part of the scene that really just didn't exist before. I think a lot of them maybe heard Green Day or The Offspring and thought it was cool and kind of wanted to be involved with the scene in some way, but we're kind of not really sure how to go about it and we're probably a little bit scared because let's be honest, punks can be real asshole, not exactly the most friendly welcoming people in the world. Maybe you kind of wanted to be in a punk band, but you played trombone in your junior high jazz band instead of guitar or drums or bass. So you kind of felt like there wasn't really a place for you, but then you hear that someone's starting a ska band and they need a horn player and there's your chance to be in a band. So a ton of those kids came into the scene and started bands who made their way into the lineups of smaller shows. So in like 96 or 97, it wouldn't be uncommon to go see some hardcore band coming through on tour with some local ska band opening up for them. For example, I remember seeing the Suicide Machines in like 95 or 96, opening for some totally random band like Zao or something. And even though if I'm being honest, I wouldn't call most of those local ska bands good by any stretch of the imagination, it was cool to have those really mixed bills with everything from like pop punk to thrash metal to hardcore and ska as opposed to now where the default is that every band on the bill sounds exactly the same. Gent band number one supported by gent band number two. And in the opening slot, we have something completely different, a metalcore band with gent influences. Wow, so much variety. And so if you turn back the clock to 1998 or so, it felt like ska was gonna be a permanent fixture in the scene and possibly the most commercially viable form of punk or alternative music. But what we didn't know is that we were in the middle of a giant bubble that was about to pop. But before I get to that part, I wanted to shout out a couple of the ska bands that I personally found the most interesting. Voodoo Glow Skulls, who brought in a little bit more of like a metal and hardcore influence. Homegrown, who were a little bit more on the pop punk side of things, but did have some ska parts. Very underrated band. I wonder how can we be so And by the way, speaking of pop punk, these shirts are now available in my merch store. There's a link to those in the description if you want to pick one up. And Skank and Pickle, very fun, creative band, started by Mike Park, who was also behind Asian Man Records. And Less Than Jake. Out of all the 90s ska punk bands, I would say that their music probably actually aged the best. And along with No Idea Records, they played a big role in putting the Florida punk scene on the map like it is today. And of course, there were tons and tons more. I wasn't the biggest fan of ska from a musical perspective, but I did think it was cool just to see all this like creative energy and DIY hustle going on. And one thing I really appreciate about ska in hindsight is that it was quite a bit more diverse than the punk scene in general. Skank and Pickle and Homegrown had some very rare Asian representation. Voodoo Glow Skulls had that like Inland Empire Chicano kind of influence. There are quite a few women and black people in ska punk bands, which unfortunately you can't really say about the punk scene in general. 
So there was a lot of cool stuff going on in the ska punk scene, but as we all know, that was not gonna last forever. Which brings us to the next part, The Fall, from roughly 1999 to 2001 or so. In the trailer for Pick It Up, one of those Scott documentaries I mentioned before, which I haven't seen, but does look really good, they mentioned new metal as the thing that popped the Scott punk bubble. All of a sudden, new metal was cool, and ska is not cool. Like, 99, it was like, bam, nobody went to ska shit. And they could be right, but I personally don't really see things that way. I don't really think that the ska and new metal fan bases overlapped much at all. Like, I don't think there was a kid who was super into dancehall crashers and then heard Slipknot and was like, fuck this ska stuff, I'm getting a jumpsuit and a clown mask. In my opinion, there were three things that I saw going on. Number one, college. The kids who got into ska in high school in the early to mid 90s went to college in the late 90s and just kind of moved on with their life. I think for most of them, ska was just a phase. It's something they just kind of got into it for a bit and had fun with it, but it wasn't like their lifestyle. As opposed to like DIY punk or hardcore, which is a lot less accessible, a lot harder to get into. And therefore, if you do get into it, you're probably like really into it. It becomes your lifestyle and identity. And so you're a lot less likely to just drop out of it. Whereas when I think of the kids from my high school that were into ska, by 2000 or so, none of them were really still into it or even really into music at all because most of them were focusing on school. And to be clear, if it was just a phase for them, that is totally okay. I have absolutely zero problem with that. Nobody is obligated to be a lifer in any genre of music and there just weren't a lot of ska lifers. Second, the rise of the American Pie TRL flavor of pop punk that I've talked about before, with the biggest band there being, of course, Blink-182. This stuff was just as accessible as ska, but to put it bluntly, not as corny. The early bands like Operation Ivy and Rancid and the Boss Tones still had a lot of that punk edge, but by the time we got to bands like Aquabats and Goldfinger, there was no edge left. This stuff was very safe, family friendly even. And at least in America, we tend to like our rock bands to have somewhat of an edge, at least be like PG-13. And Save Ferris or whatever is very G-rated stuff, which to a lot of people, come across as corny. And I'm not making a personal judgment here. I don't think there's anything wrong with being corny. I'm just saying that I think that's how a lot of people felt about it. And by contrast, Blink-182, Newfound Glory, and Sum 41 weren't exactly G.G. Allen either. Not the most hardcore shit in the world by any means. But they were at least edgy enough that your parents probably didn't approve of it. I want to fuck a dog in the ass. If your mom approves of the music you're listening to in high school, that's probably not a good sign for the future of that genre. And lastly, none of the bands in that second, later wave of ska punk really had any big stars. Like if I ran into any of them at the grocery store, I'm not sure that I would recognize them. And for a genre to stay relevant, you need stars. And so I think the combination of the fans moving on, the corniness, and the lack of stars is what really killed ska punk. You're gonna need a good head to wear while you're skanking. And voila, a fedora can do it just like that. And I know there's gonna be some people that tell me Ska is not dead, that it's alive and well because Goldfinger put out a new album and they saw Real Big Fish at some festival in Spain or Orange County playing to 35,000 people. Or maybe you'll mention the Interrupters, but pretty much any kind of music from the 90s or 2000s still has a viable market in Europe and Orange County. And the fact that a legacy band has a new album really doesn't change my opinion. The fact of the matter is that Ska Punk boom is clearly over. Which brings us to the last part. What exactly is the legacy of ska punk. Well, from my point of view, I'm not actually sure that there is much of one. It does certainly have a small, very dedicated, diehard fan base, but I don't really hear any ska influences in any current music. Nobody's really bringing back the ska aesthetic or anything like they have with the emo aesthetic. It seems like the main thing is just that it was the on-ramp into alternative music for a chunk of kids during those few years that it was hot. I find it especially strange that that first wave of ska punk bands seems like they're kind of forgotten. For example, I never hear anybody talk about Operation Ivy. They only have 275,000 Spotify listeners, for example, which is kind of strange to me given that they kind of kicked the whole thing off and they're a great band. But with that said, the ska punk scene did launch the careers of a few people who are very influential. John Feldman from Goldfinger, who as a lot of you know, is a super successful producer who's worked with a massive amount of bands like Use, Black Veil Brides, Escape the Fate, Panic at the Disco, Hilary Duff. His discography is ridiculous. 
and it was also where Fueled by Ramen started, co-founded by Vinny, the drummer of Less Than Jake, which is one of the most important labels the last 15 years, and brought us bands like Fall Out Boy, Paramore, Panic at the Disco, and 21 Pilots, among many others. And although the genre isn't what it used to be in terms of popularity, the people who like ska really, 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 really like ska. Very passionate fan base. Hopefully they don't hate this video too much. So clearly there's something there that means a lot to somebody, and I will always respect that. All right, my friends, that does it for this video about the ska punk boom of the 90s. Let me know what you think in the comments. In particular, I'm interested to know about the legacy part. Is there something I'm missing? Does ska have a bigger legacy than what I talked about? Let me know what you think. Before I let you go, I've got some new merch out like this cartoon monster shirt and this pop punk shirt, both of which you can get at my merch store. There's a link in the description. And also, as always, I wanna thank everyone who supports us on Patreon, especially those of you who support us at the true cult level or above. Patrons get access to every podcast a week early. There's a members only private Discord server that I'm in. I started doing patron only Q and A's. If you want a deeper answer to one of your questions, there's a way to have me review your music or video or artwork or anything else you might want me to take a look at. So if that sounds cool, you can check out the Patreon at the link in the description. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.